So, return to meeting. What just happened here? There we go. Okay, good enough. So, now I hope I'm recording. The uh, A raft is made of a plastic block with a density of 650 kg per meters cubed. And its dimensions are 2 meters by 3 meters by 5 meters. Um, the information there I've given you, I've given you the volume of the raft. And I've also given you the density of the raft. So, you can find a whole whack load of things from this. And take your formula sheet and I want you guys to try these questions. So what is the volume of the raft? Well, you get it from that guy, length times width times height. What is the mass? Well, you've got your volume, you've got your density. You can find your mass from that. What is the weight? Aha. Uh -huh. Mass times gravity, 9.8. Uh, Newtons, what is the raft's apparent weight in the water? These are things here that we I want you guys to try. And the answers are there. I'm pretty sure they are. There they are. Okay. The answers are there and I want you to make mistakes and try try these out. Because we have our test three. Um, next week will be quiz three. And then the week after will be test four. I'm pretty sure that's how it goes. Okay. So um, we're getting down to the nitty gritty. Um, these are questions here that you will see again. And this one here has to do with your car's brakes. Okay, there uh, you push the pedal. And here are the four tires and the brake shoes associated with the four tires. What is happening? And I think once you try these out, it's kind of interesting to see how the physics or rather maybe the mechanics of how the uh, this system works. And uh, try this out. It shouldn't take you too long because you guys have the answers there. But what I'm more interested in is you guys seeing a question and recognizing how to solve it. So everything there we've pretty much done from weeks one to seven. You don't really need to recall. But there may be a, a formula or two that you may need again. So um, keep all, all of your... Um, formula sheets should be accessible and if they're not let me know I'll get them all for you but these are good little questions there try these out and another thing there with week 7 lecture it's not just mathematical with formulas and you know math calculator there's also some there's lots of goodies as far as definitions and uh, intuition questions like uh, from uh, just check the PowerPoint there from yesterday if you haven't checked it out yet, okay? Um, but again, quiz three will open up there next week, and test three will be the week after. So we're getting down to it. We're getting down to it, okay? Um, do you guys have any questions there for me right off the bat? If you uh, if there's any emergencies, let me know. Uh, as far as I know, the uh, there might be a couple of anomalies still out there and these people know who they are and they've got uh, medical extension or, uh, you know, everything's taken care of. But I think everything should be all right. Let me know if they're not because, yeah, we basically got, I think this is a short half of the semester, so we're only looking at six weeks and then it's bye-bye. All right. And then y'all are off to your nursing and paramedics, which is where I want you to be. I don't want you to be in this pre-health program any longer than you need to. Uh, if you guys got nothing, I got nothing. We'll motor forward. Okay. And yeah, I think we've got a good group of students. Very good. So um, if you have to leave early or you're coming late, which you wouldn't guess it, get this message anyway, because if you were coming late, you're not here right now, but everything will be posted up to YouTube as normal. Welcome to temperature, heat, and thermodynamics. Now again, we, uh, what's going on here, man? Why can't I grab this thing, pull this up a little bit? There we go. Okay, so you guys have covered some of this stuff there uh, last semester in chem. Uh, Q is equal to MC delta T. There's a couple of new formulas here 
Again, nothing too crazy. It's not like a formula, like, you know, this big. They're all little rinky-dinky little formulas, and uh, it's just a matter of I'm going to give you the information. It might be just plug and play, or I'll give you the information. You'll have to plug into another formula in order to plug and play. That's, hey, that's what it is. Let's go. Heat versus temperature. Okay, are heat and temperature the same thing? And the answer is, great movie, by the way. All right, basketball team back in the 90s there with Shaq. But the answer is, absolutely not. Heat and temperature are not the same thing. Okay? Heat is energy. And it's measured in joules, or joules is the um, SI way of counting heat. Calories is more common. It's what we, uh, it's the American uh, Imperial, uh, British Imperial system, okay? Um, you'll notice there that heat is energy, it's warmth. And there really isn't a definition for cold because cold is just the absence of heat. And so that's why we kind of have a definition for heat, but we really don't for cold. All right, that kind of a thing. Uh, temperature is a measure of heat energy, and it's a property of matter. But when you look at temperature, like here in my, in my office here, it's about 21 degrees. Let's say it is. But does that mean that every atom in here is 21 degrees? No. There's, an, there's a molecule of oxygen over there that's 28 degrees. Oh, there's a bit of hydrogen over here that is at 17 degrees. Temperature, the thermometer that is, you know, sensing the heat in the room, and the higher the heat, the mercury will go up, right? Which we'll actually get into there today of why mercury goes up when you increase the temperature. But temperature is basically the average of the room. We'll get more into that there, okay? Um, loosely thought of as the hotness or coldness of a substance. That's what temperature is, right? Um, it's too vague and it's not really scientific. Uh, when one person finds, uh, yeah, room might be, uh, it just happens throughout the course of my marriage, whatever temperature I feel comfortable in the room at, my wife doesn't. So it, it, it's a very subjective if you just go by, it's, oh, it's hot, it's cold, these kinds of things. Temperature is the measure of the average kinetic energy per molecule in a substance. So if I have, um, I don't know, my phone, okay? And if we took the temperature of this, some molecules in here will not be at 21 degrees, but we just, temperature is the average kinetic energy. And please don't forget kinetic energy. Kinetic is just another word for moving, motion energy, all right? Remember, uh, Things that are solids, the atoms are not free to move around, so they vibrate. All right. And then when we increase the temperature, there's going to be a popcorn effect, which I'm going to get into again. I'm just talking, Ian. Be quiet. There we go. <laughs> now, let's have a look here. Um, thermometers are devices used to measure temperature. They are based on the premise that the mercury inside the glass tube will expand or contract when heated or cooled. Interesting. Well, there's, uh, yeah, there's lots there. There are three different temperature scales commonly used. There's the degree Fahrenheit, which is the American British Imperial. Degrees Celsius, which is SI, what we use here in Canada, and 99.9% .9 of the entire planet. And Kelvin, which incorporates absolute zero, minus 213.15 degrees, all right? And that's just for scientific. We use that there for scientific. Please note that a degree Celsius is equal to one degree Kelvin. 
So one degree Celsius is equal to one degree Kelvin. You guys know this already. Um, degree Fahrenheit, they're a little different. It's not as big as a degree Celsius. Um, we use the uh, phase transition temperature, freezing and boiling points to compare three scales. All right, good enough. So you have a look here. This is kind of rinky dinky. I'm sure you guys are all over this. Okay, I'm sure you guys are aware that the freezing point of water is zero degrees. Uh, okay, and the uh, boiling point <clears throat> is 100 degrees. Um, I don't think that I would ever ask you, um, I can't say, uh, it would never be my goal to mm, get you to remember that the boiling point of water in Fahrenheit is 212 degrees. No. If we were in Texas, I'm sure that would work as a good exam question, but not in my class, okay? The only things that I'm worried about are, uh, well, that didn't really work out very well, but Celsius and Kelvin, okay? Um... We'll see. There is no upper limit on the temperature scale. Okay, like absolute zero minus 273 degrees. Okay, which is absolute zero Kelvin. But there is no upper limit on what temperature can be that we know of. Okay. Um, in yesterday's class, week seven class there. God, that's weird to say yesterday's class, week seven. But that's what it is. Um, we learned there that there are four types uh, of matter. Solid Okay, liquid, gaseous, and then there's a fourth one, which is plasma. And I'll talk more about that there in a second. Okay. A more definitive definition of temperature, the Kelvin temperature of matter is proportional to the average kinetic energy of the constituent particles. So if we only use the Kelvin temperature, right, like absolute zero is minus 273.15 degrees Celsius, okay? So um, atoms are moving, and then we're still cooling it down. We're getting closer and closer, and you'll see there that the atoms are slowing down, and then we get close to minus 273. Weird things happen. And uh, you can Google this. I'm not going to talk about it, but you can Google it. Non- Newtonian fluids and you take gases like helium okay which is a gas at room temperature and you cool it all the way down close to absolute zero weird things start to happen like uh, these gases will turn into liquids because they're so cold right but then weird things happen and they start climbing up the uh, rims of glasses and doing strange things that liquids shouldn't be doing. So non-Newtonian fluids, I'm not even touching it. <laughs> okay. But if we use the Kelvin temperature, absolute zero, the atoms in theory are not moving. That's it, man. They're done. But then as soon as we get to like one degree Kelvin... They're kind of moving. So you see, according to the Kelvin temperature scale, the increase in the Kelvin scale will also represent an increase in the kinetic energy. Okay? So even something uh, minus 80 degrees Celsius. Minus 80 degrees Celsius, which is what? 213 degrees Kelvin has huge energy in it. Even though it's so cold, minus 80, so cold, those atoms are still moving because they have energy. All right. Uh, what else we got? As the temperature increases, the average kinetic of the uh, energy of the particles increases, like we just said, right? So here I have zero degrees Kelvin, no movement. Here we're at 200 degrees Kelvin, which is what? Minus 73 degrees Celsius. Still crazy cold. These things are moving around. And then if we go up to 400 degrees Kelvin, which is 173 degrees Celsius, 73 degrees, uh, or sorry, 273, 133. So 33 degrees above boiling water, these things are moving more. That's all we're talking about here. The higher the temperature, the more movement we get. 
because temperature is a representative of the kinetic energy in a given system. This is what I wanted to show you guys right here. This is a good, you will see this again. You'll see this on test three. Oops, did I just say that? Good. So this is um, just a kind of an explanation here of the four states of matter. All right, and what's going on. There's a couple of definitions here that I want you guys to know. So if anything below zero, water is a solid, right? It's ice. doesn't matter if it's minus 20, minus 40, minus ice can be uh, minus 100. It's still ice. All right. And um, let's say the ice is at minus 20 and we start adding heat to it. We have here we're adding heat in kilojoules to the system. All right. And this is what's going on with the temperature. So I have ice at minus 20 and now I'm adding heat to it. And you'll see there that the ice is getting warmer and warmer. So these ice molecules, the uh, water molecules locked up in the ice, they can't move freely. So they're vibrating. Okay. Minus 20, minus 10, minus 5, minus 1. And then at zero, we start to get the popcorn effect where these water molecules tied up in the ice have so much energy within them that they start breaking apart from the collective ice unit. And Boom, you get these water molecules falling off. And interestingly enough, you'll see that once we get to zero degrees, I'm still adding heat to this thing, but the ice isn't increasing in temperature. What is going on here? It's this transitional phase between a state of matter, between a solid and a liquid. And we call this the heat of fusion. And you'll see here that the temperature, I'm adding heat to this, to this block of ice, but it's not increasing in temperature. What is happening is the popcorn. The ice molecules are breaking off and this is how the ice will change into a liquid. And then once all the ice has changed into a liquid, now we start the process again. We're adding more heat, as we all we've done. But in this case here, the temperature rises. Okay. And then once we get up to, and these water molecules, now they have movement, but they're still attracted to each other. So they're, but they're moving. And the more heat we add, they're moving faster and faster and faster and faster. And then all of a sudden at 100 degrees, you'll see here again. I'm adding heat to this, but the system is not going up in temperature. Why what's happening? This is called the heat of vaporization. And again, it's the popcorn effect. All these liquid water molecules, so much energy they're moving around and then one of them gets so much energy, pchoom, popcorn, and it's off into space. Welcome to steam. And then we can actually, once all of the uh, steam has been made and there's nothing left in the pot anymore, we can actually, here's your upper limit now. We can actually still keep adding heat to this thing, okay? And up at around 5,000 degrees Celsius, all right? That's where we get this fourth state of matter called plasma. And if you look here, a water molecule when it's, when it's ice is basically the same as a water molecule when it's liquid, is basically the same as a water molecule when it is a gas. All right, your water molecule, there's your oxygen, here's your two uh, hydrogens, that's what it is. But what happens there um, when molecules or atoms, they... they uh, around 5,000 degrees, they change into plasma. Well, what, pl what plasma is, it's kind of this primordial soup. That, like an atom is a, is a nucleus with electrons, right? Well, when you get into the plasma state, those electrons are blown right off. Are they destroyed? No. But they're the blown right off so that they're completely free 
of the uh, nucleus and you get this soup of protons, neutrons, nuclei, electrons. It's just this soup and that's what plasma is. All right. And found in stars. That's where uh, we'll see it. Okay. This one here, what I want you to know is be able to break it down. What's happening? There's a number of good questions in here. Heat of fusion. What is it? Heat of vaporization. What is it? What is happening in A, B, C, D, and this one here would be E. What's going on? Being able to uh, explain this diagram, it's not too bad. Okay. And ask questions if you need to. Temperature, the higher the temperature of matter, the greater the motion of the molecules and thus the greater kinetic energy of the molecule. If you put your fingers into a hot fluid, why is your finger warmed? Interesting. What happens when you put your finger into a bowl of hot water? Well, the heat starts to move. Heat doesn't move from a colder substance to a hotter substance. Heat only moves from a hotter substance to a colder substance. Okay. What else we got? When we use the thermometer to measure the temperature of something, thermal energy flows between the substance and the thermometer. Of course it does. When both have the same average kinetic energy per molecule, we say that they are in thermal equilibrium. Ooh, there's a good little word for a test. What do we got here? I love Bill Nye. Please watch this. Bill Nye is awesome. And uh, <clears throat> please have a look at this uh, after the, because uh, I can't play it now. I'll get in trouble there for copyright. So that's a really good little video. Bill Nye explains everything pretty well. And he's basically going to say exactly what I'm saying, but in a lot cooler fashion. Welcome to thermal expansion. Now, this might be new to some of you guys. Uh, it, it's not overly difficult, but it's just the whole process of what goes on when something gets hot or cold. As the temperature of a substance increases, the molecules start to move faster. Now, whether they're moving or vibrating, you know, the hotter something gets, the more energy these guys have, and the faster they start moving. And what this does is it results in a thermal expansion. And what is this? Um, the air in a balloon expands when heated. So if you have a balloon, just normal balloon, tie it up, put a lighter under it. Before, or some type of heating element or whatever that's not going to bust the rubber or the plastic, but it'll get bigger the more you heat it because the more energy you're putting into the air inside the balloon, the, the air inside the balloon is going to start moving faster and faster and it's actually going to push the balloon out and make the balloon bigger. The opposite is also true. You take a balloon, tie it all up. There's five liters of gas in this balloon. Throw it in the freezer, close the door, leave it for 15, 20 minutes. Take the balloon out. Your balloon is about this big. Because gases are compressible, gases are, uh, there's a lot of empty space in there, and all of those molecules inside the balloon are going to contract and get all cold, and they're going to, and so your balloon is going to look like this. So take your balloon out, put it back on the table, and in 15 minutes, shh, it'll be back up to the size that it was. Um, mercury in a thermometer rises when it, the mercury gets heated. Railway railway there we go in come on railway tracks they actually get longer on a hot day bridges all this uh anything there that we make in construction they take this thermal expansion into account and especially here look at our roads you know like uh, that's one of the reasons why taxes are higher here in canada than they are in warmer countries like even the states because our roads buckle here we've got hot and cold and they take all of this uh, on a hot day you know it, it does get hot here i remember last summer there for two weeks 
We were living in the basement because it was 38 degrees. And that's a pretty big difference from being minus 25 in the wintertime. That's what a, almost that's a 60 degree difference. And that's a lot of wear and tear on any type of construction built system, whether it's a building or a bridge or whatever. So, but they take all of this into account and there's a mathematical formula. It's not bad. Telephone wires sag in the summer heat. Jar lids are easier to open when you put them under hot water. And what I, I take a pickle jar and I bang it against the counter, but yeah, the uh, interesting little, uh, if you can't get a jar open, put it under hot water. We know that the average kinetic energy of atoms increases with high temperature. Okay, but what about solids? The solids atoms are not free to move like a gas, but they can vibrate. So consider the, uh, this rod here. This rod has a length L. Now we heat the rod. Okay, and the atoms, like, um, don't do this, but the because uh, you could get hurt but if you take like a, a butter knife okay a metal butter knife and you take a lighter to one end okay metal tends to pick up heat very quickly right and what will happen the heat will get transferred and within 10 seconds ow all right you've now dropped the knife because the knife has gotten so hot even though you uh, put a lighter on the other side right so since uh, these molecules are bound into a fixed position, they simply vibrate with a larger amplitude. So the more heat that you give to this rod, all right, they're going to vibrate more so, depending upon the heat. So, and you have a look here at this comparison. Here's the rod at 20 degrees Celsius. Here's the rod at a higher temperature. And you'll see that the rod has expanded a certain amount. All right, because when the molecules are cool or cold, they tend to contract, just like the balloon in the freezer. All right, but if you take the balloon out of the freezer, things will take up more, um, things will kind of go back to normal. All right, so what do we got here? There is your rod at normal temperature with length L, here is your rod at the increased temperature, and here is your change in L. That's all we're looking at. Welcome to your formula, okay? So, this is what we got. We can write this mathematically as, let's have a look. Change in L, or delta L, is the change in the rod's length. That little piece right there at the end. So this formula is written to find this. And then we've got alpha L. Alpha is the coefficient of linear expansion and has units of one degree Celsius. L is the rod's initial length. So just be careful. This is one term. Alpha is another term, which we'll get into. L is the original length and delta T is the change in temperature. So there's four bananas going on here. Let's do that again. Change in L, all right? Delta, uh, sorry, alpha, which is the coefficient of linear expansion. You have the rod's original length and you have the change in temperature, okay? We'll get into this. Um, engineers, of course, they use the uh, expansion joints to account for thermal expansion. Okay. And everything there that they make, they have to include this. All right. And, you know, imagine living in a hot country. Like I was in uh, the Middle East there in the uh, Persian Gulf, the Arabian Gulf for, I don't know, man, 11 years, nine years. And... Yeah, wintertime drops down to about 10 degrees Celsius. You might get one night there at 5 degrees Celsius, but generally there as soon as May hits, 
it's over 30. Uh, June, middle of June, over 40. And then when you get into July, August, and September, oh yeah, 52 degrees. So everything there that they build has to accommodate for this. All right? Because you don't want your skyscraper falling over, you know, in August because it's too hot. Everything, every, things will expand and your engineering concepts have to allow for that. Uh, in concrete, small spaces are left between slabs to allow for thermal expansion. So crazy, eh? a concrete block actually expands. And you'll see there that that's why they allow them because there, there's a bit of free movement there for this thing to expand in the hot sun. Um, so it's kind of the same thing here. The hotter, the hotter things get, the more they expand. That's what we're talking about here. And just because something is a solid doesn't mean that it can't expand. So we just have a look at this right here. Uh, the center span of a steel bridge is 1,200 meters long on a winter day when the temperature is minus 5. How much longer is the span on a summer day when the temperature is 35 degrees? Given that the coefficient of linear expansion for steel, okay, is this number here. Now, let's go back. This one right here, the alpha, that's the scientifically determined number, okay? That one there you can find on any Google, okay? I'll give you everything. You don't need to Google it, all right? But this one here is going to be a strange number that scientists have deter determined is how much this metal is going to expand per degree Celsius, Okay, so that's the only odd duck in this thing. Everything else is going to be uh, in meters, meters, and uh, all right. So let's have a look here. Um, to read this again, the center span of a steel bridge is 1,200 meters long on a winter day at minus 5. How much longer is the span on a summer day when the temperature is 35 with this alpha number? So first thing you got to do, you've... Um, you can determine there your delta T, 35 minus negative 5. And I did this there on purpose just to show you, be careful. Because if your 35 degrees is what, uh, you know, the on the hot day, and then minus 5 on a cold day, what's your difference of degrees Celsius? Okay, so I don't want you to go 35 minus 5 because then the differences between high and low temperature is only 30 degrees, which isn't right. Okay, so 35 minus minus 5, double negative, flip the sign, becomes positive. So 35 plus 5 be 40. Okay, and that one goes into here. Oh, sorry, right in there. There's your 40 degrees right there. Um, your original length was 1200 meters. That one goes in here. And then this big funky number here, which uh, l looks weird, but that's all right. So there's your funky number there. That's your alpha for steel, which is your coefficient of linear expansion for steel. All right. And you'll see there that the change in the bridge from 35 degrees down to minus five Funny enough, eh? The bridge moves half a meter. Sorry, I'm trying to get this on my camera. Crazy, eh? And they have to accommodate for that. So it's a simple, it's not a bad question. Plug and play. Um, let me know if you have any issues with it. Um, this is just going on uh, about the same thing. This whole idea of thermal expansion is all of these metals here, it's kind of like a physical property. They all have their own alpha number. Hopefully that makes sense. They all have their own rate at which they will expand. And you'll see here that aluminum differs from iron. And lead will be different from aluminum. And gold and silver, they're all different. So they'll all expand at their own rate. 
depending upon the temperature, okay? Um, in your thermostats at home, when you turn on the temperature, uh, when you, yeah, you, you, how does the thermostat know to turn off if you set the thermostat to 21 degrees Celsius? And it's currently, it's cold in your room, so you turn it up to 21. Uh, I start to get some heat in here, but how does the thermostat know when to shut off at 21? Well, it's interesting. It's called a bimetallic strip. Bimetallic just means that there's two pieces of metal that are involved in this situation. And you'll see here, at a normal temperature there, both pieces of metal are side by side, they're stuck together, everything's good but they are not the same metals. And if they're not the same metals, that means that they're, they are both going to have different alphas, right? They're both going to expand at a different rate and they're gonna do different things. So what they do is one of the pieces of metal, when it gets hot, it bends this way, all right? And another piece of the metal, when it gets cold, it'll bend this way. And you see how it's kind of taken the other one with it? Okay, when this one's bending, it kind of takes them both, right? So when one metal expands more with a given temperature than the other, the strip bends. That's all this is. That, And I'll show you right here. This is in your thermostat. And it's this bimetallic strip. And you see what happens is when you turn up the temperature, you know, to 21, and the heat comes on and it's starting to warm the room up, right? And it's average temperature of the room, right? Because the, ho the hot air is coming up through the floor, but your thermostat gauge is on the wall, right? Completely kind of different. And when the temperature starts to warm up, one of the uh, one of the metals in this bimetallic strip will start to bend, and therefore now it'll turn the thermostat off. All right, so the thermostat gets turned off because it's 21 degrees in here, so the furnace turns off, and then it starts to cool down in the room, and it goes back here, which then will turn it on again. So that's why your furnace can come on and off without you touching it. It's this bimetallic strip. Thermal expansion of liquids. Oh yes, not just metals. Okay, generally liquids will expand more than solids. Since liquids do not hold their shape, it is best to consider a change in volume caused by thermal expansion. When a container holding a liquid is heated, the level of the fluid will usually rise. So if you have one liter at room temperature and you heat it, the volume is going to increase when you heat it, okay? The level of fluid will usually rise because the increase in volume of the liquid exceeds the increase in volume of the solid container, okay? Now you look at mercury. Mercury is, um, and the only metal that's a liquid at room temperature, okay? So when the mercury in a thermometer is heated, the mercury in the tube will expand and go up the thermometer, okay? When, the, when it gets cool outside, the mercury contracts and goes down the thermometer. That's how it works. There is one notable exception to this rule, and it is water. And... Uh, Water is the greatest substance besides oxygen for us, all right? But water is a strange molecule, probably one of the most strangest um, molecules out there because it shouldn't be what it is. And water is bent, all right? And the reason that water is bent is because of that oxygen and it's the shape of water that gives it its incredible properties, all right? And uh, you ever wonder why uh, a million ton iceberg can float 
in the ocean? It's because um, if you take a stone, drop it into water, what happens to it? <whistles> Goes right down to the bottom. We talked about that there yesterday with the buoyant force and the stone isn't really pushing away any more water. The stone is more dense than water. That's generally why stones go to, go to the bottom. An iceberg can't be less dense than water. Iceberg has to be more because it's ice. If I hit you with water, if I hit you with uh, a glass of water without the glass, ow, you hit me with water. Ow, that didn't hurt at all. But if you hit me with a snowball, that hurts. So you'd think that ice or snow is more dense, more, you know, but it's not. It's actually lighter than water. We'll get into that more. Um, oh, by the way, there is a movie here. So there's two movies that I need you to watch. Um, I think there's another one coming. All right. Movie there for the bimetallic strip. Not too bad. Yeah, you have a look here. You move this out of the way. Like here at uh, Kempenfelt Bay, downtown Barrie, or Lake Ontario, or Lake Huron, or uh, yeah, we were just up in uh, Sauble Beach and Owen Sound there in the weekend. Love that little town. It's great. And uh, we have a cottage out uh, near Hepworth. And uh, the little creek that is the little river there that's by our uh, cottage there. I've never seen it like this. It was a raging, oh man, there was full trees with dirty roots. I mean, 30 meters long floating down the river. This thing was, uh, so just take care. This is the uh, bad season there for freezing or for melting snow. All the rivers are uh, pretty crazy. So just take it easy. But you have a look here of what's going on. In the summertime, it'll be 20 degrees on top of the water, but then it'll be 18 down below and then you look at the winter time it'll be zero degrees on top of the water and you think what about the poor fish in the winter time well it doesn't freeze it never freezes on the bottom and there's a reason why water is a strange beast um, above four degrees Celsius so water that is above four degrees so it's kind of liquid it expands when it is heated just like any other liquid just like any metal if you heat water that's above four degrees or heat anything like metal, it'll expand like it should, like we've been talking about there for the past couple slides. But between zero and four degrees, water does something very different. When it is heated, it actually contracts, okay? And when it is cooled, it expands only between zero and four. So when water is between zero and four and it gets cooler, it expands and gets bigger and less dense. Um, this anomaly accounts for why lakes freeze on the surface first. Okay. And you see this water here, this ice, it's less dense. So that's why it goes to the top and the warmer water, which is more dense, goes to the bottom. Have a look at here, what goes on in the summertime. We're above four degrees. Here we're below. This is the strange one between zero and four. Everything come on say flips. But here in the summertime, the warmer the water, all right, the more it expands. And here it is, it becomes less dense. The colder, it becomes more dense, all right? Um, below four degrees, the cooler water is now less dense and rises to the surface. So this is a good little slide to understand that generally the rule is everything when you heat it expands except for water between zero and four degrees. If you heat water, okay, that is between zero and four degrees, it does not expand, it contracts, all right? It's the opposite. So please write that down, okay? That's a good little question there to uh, uh, ask you. 
Thermal expansion of gases, the volume expanses, uh, expansion of gases is larger than that of solids or liquids, of course, and does not vary with the type of gas involved. As long as the pressure remains constant, the volume occupied by a given law of gas is proportional to its temperature. And you all have seen this there before from your chem, okay? Charles Law, uh, I don't think I included it on uh, this formula sheet, but uh, I think you guys must have it somewhere. I'll let you guys know if you guys need it. Okay, um, when you're doing Charles Law, uh, please note that T1 and T2, okay, they are in Kelvin. There is no Celsius in this, okay? If I give you Celsius, you have to change it to Kelvin. And basically what this is, is um, it's kind of similar to, the Bo uh, to Boyle's Law where you have scenario one. Here I have a balloon. It's got a certain volume at a certain temperature, Kelvin. And then I put it into the fridge or the freezer, okay? Now it will have a new volume because it has a new temperature, all right? So you've got scenario one, two bits of information. Scenario two, two bits of information. So altogether, you got four bits of information. I'll give you three. You solve for number four. That's all that one works. Any issues with that, let me know, but this should just be kind of review there from Chem. Uh, the ideal gas law expresses the relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature. Uh, you guys have seen that one there too. PV divided by T is equal to PV divided by T. Um, there are two ways to increase the temperature of a substance by exposing it to something that has a higher temperature or doing work on it. Okay. Both of my hands are the same temperature right now, okay? But if I do work on them, now they're on fire. Thermal energy. If you consider a, a piston pushing down on a gas in a cylinder, you're forcing the piston down requires a force. Applying this force through a distance, okay, means you are doing work. Work is equal to FD, force times distance, right? You guys just did that there for your lab, which I hope went all right. Uh, I hope it did. Hopefully there it was a bit of fun. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and the work is done against the gas. So you're pressing this plunger down and there's gas in here. You're compressing the gas. Right? You're doing work. You're pushing this, this plunger down a certain distance. You're putting a force, so you're doing some work on it. You're compressing the gas. And what you're doing to the gas is you're making it unhappy. You're taking, it's kind of the same analogy as if you have 20 people in your backyard having a barbecue, and then all of a sudden now, everybody, come on into the kitchen. We want everyone in the kitchen. So now you put 20 people into a little kitchen, and friction is going to, you know, people are going to start to get heated and angry because you've increased the pressure. Okay. Kind of the same analogy. Um, a diesel engine uses this concept. Okay. There's a diesel air mixture. Okay. Which is compressed into the cylinder. You'll see right here. This is a uh, diesel and oxygen. All right. You compress it. The mixture ignites. Boom. And it's this boom that pushes the piston back and there's your work. Now you're able to take that recoil and make your car go. And the pressure increases from the explosion, pushes the piston down. This causes the crankshaft to turn and therefore now we can get some work done. Okay, same thing there. How are we doing? We okay? Are there any questions? Is anybody still there? I guess we'll find out at the end. Um, when you strike a coin with a hammer, the coin will get warmer. This is because the molecules in the coin begin to jiggle because you've whacked them. Uh, this jiggling causes an increase in the kinetic energy of each molecule in the coin. We say that the warmer an object gets, the more kinetic each mole the more kinetic energy. It has. And we talked about that earlier, right? Uh, the increase in temperature on the Kelvin scale 
is directly corresponding to the amount of kinetic energy there these molecules have. And this energy is known as thermal energy. Okay. Thermal energy is equal to the kinetic energy and the potential energy. In gases, the thermal energy is made up of kinetic energy only. Gases do not contain potential energy. Right? Potential energy is stored energy. This pen, I've lifted it up, it now has more, it has potential energy, which can be changed to kinetic energy. Okay? In solids and liquids, though, the thermal energy is made up of both kinetic and potential energy. The energy transfer from one substance to another due to temperature difference between the objects. And we've done this there, like if you have, um, I don't know, uh, a hot cup of coffee. Woo, it's too hot. I don't think I've ever done this, but you throw an ice cube into here. And maybe, uh, yeah, I've actually done that with hot soup there with my kids, right? You'll throw an ice cube into the tomato soup or whatever. And uh, what is going on? Is the ice giving coldness to the soup? Or is the soup transferring heat to the ice? Well, it's the heat moves from the hot cold. So the direction of energy flows is always from a warmer to a cooler object. According to this definition, matter does not have heat. It transfers heat when in contact with another object. Therefore, heat is thermal energy in transit. Interesting. So heat is thermal energy on the move somewhere else. Heat measured in joules represented by the symbol Q. You know where this is going. You've seen this there before so this should be pretty easy peasy. For substances that are in thermal contact energy flow continues until thermal equilibrium where both objects have the same temperature. Question, what does it mean to be cold? Can you actually add cold to something? No. How does a refrigerator work? That's a good question. How does a refrigerator work? It has the Freon in the back of the fridge, and so what it does is it takes the air out of the fridge and puts it through this, this um, the Freon and what the Freon does is it absorbs the heat, takes the heat from the air inside the fridge, and then the air gets pumped back in, and it's very cold. All right? Interesting there. Yeah, you guys have seen this there before. Q is equal to MC delta T, where Q is the actual heat in joules. Mass C is what we call the specific heat capacity. All right, and again, like the alpha, um, like the alpha here, okay, every substance has their own. So here, with this alpha here, we were talking about the thermal expansion, right? Aluminum is different from gold, which is different from silver, which is different from whatever, okay? And now I think I've lost my slide. Uh, no, right here, good. Okay, C is the specific heat capacity. And what this means is every element or every substance has an ability to absorb heat and retain it. That's what this means. And a, a substance's ability to absorb and retain that heat that's all. It, and it's different for every single element or substance. Okay. And we'll get into the numbers of uh, what goes on here. But uh, this will be uh, sometimes they're a strange number as well. And delta T is this change in temperature. And uh, just note there that sp the specific heat capacity is the amount of energy required to heat one gram of a substance one degree Celsius. Now, before I move on any further, um, 
we uh, we live in the in southern Ontario, right? We're surrounded by the Great Lakes, and water has an ex. And again, water is a strange beast. Water has this uncanny ability to absorb heat and hold on to it more so than most things. And you'll notice here that in southern Ontario, generally our summers tend to be a little cooler than most. And our winters tend to be a little warmer than most. Like I lived up in Sudbury, all right, and I've uh, lived all over, and just driving a couple of hours away from water changes everything. While, um, and the reason is, is the Great Lakes that surround us. You see, in the summertime, we get massive amounts of sunlight and heat, right? So they're heating up the Great Lakes. And then eventually by September, those, you know, late August, those lakes are about as hot as they're going to get, you know, because summer has run out. So now those lakes are warmer, but then fall comes and then winter comes. It takes a long time for that for the Great Lakes to lose their heat. So that's why the winters here will be minus 18. Like minus 18 here is a bad day. Generally things are around, like especially this winter here, you know what I mean, Min uh, minus eight, minus five, minus two. It's because the Great Lakes are still kind of warm, all right? And they're keeping Southern Ontario warmer than it should be. And then in the summertime, you see, the lakes, all right, they're cold there in spring. And now we're starting to get heat from the spring and summer, but it takes them a long, water can absorb and absorb and absorb a lot of heat. Like, um, what did I read somewhere? Don't quote me on this, but the same amount of energy it takes to boil a pot of water can actually take you and a family of four all the way down in your car down to Toronto. All right. I'm off with my numbers there a little bit, but that's the analogy there. Boiling a, a pot of water takes about the same energy as driving down to Toronto because that water, it can take the heat, bring it, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. It can hold the heat. All right. So, and you'll have a look here. <clears throat> here are some uh, C values, specific heat capacity values for some different uh, things here. And you have a look here. Aluminum, concrete, copper. All right, you see these numbers here. Lead, silver. Just look at the metals. Okay. They're in the low hundreds, generally. Iron and steel, 460. Lead, 130. Silver, they're in the low hundreds. But then you look at water, seawater, all these liquids. Look at their C values in the thousands. And you see metals. Oh, you're not alone. You're. Oh, she's upstairs. There we go. You'll notice there that the metals, if you heat that same butter knife from before, ow, it gets hot so fast, you drop it, within three or four seconds you can pick it up again because metals don't hold heat basically at all. All right? So metals can transfer heat very quickly, but then they go, they can go, uh, they <clears throat> can get cool very fast. Water will hold that heat and hold it and hold it, won't let it go. So that's why the Great Lakes are warmer in winter than they should be, and they make the surrounding land a little warmer. So a low C value, like a metal, transfers heat very quickly, but then it cools down. A high C value, like water, it takes a lot of energy to get this thing hot, and once it is hot, it stays hot for a long time. And these guys here, you guys have seen these there before, okay? It's just a matter of plugging and playing. Um, you've got Q, you've got C, 
you've got M, and you've got delta T. Okay, so you have four bananas here as well. I'll give you three, you find the rest. That's how these go, okay? Um, there we go, water is not normal. It takes an enormous amount of energy to heat water. Cars routinely uh, require 350,000 joules to travel at highway speeds. This much energy is only enough to bring about five cups of water to the boiling point from 20 degrees. So there we go, okay? Water is insane. It really is. It's insane. It's the greatest molecule we've ever known. And uh, because of its bent shape, we are alive. If water wasn't bent, we wouldn't be here. Test yourself. Suppose you apply heat to one liter of water for a certain amount of time and its temperature rises by two degrees. If you apply the same heat for the same time to two liters of water, how much will the temperature rise? Well, if you double the amount, it's only going to rise up by half, which is this case here is one degree because there's two, twice as many molecules to heat up. Hopefully there that made sense. Okay. Uh, number two, when you touch a cold object, does cold travel from the cold object to your finger or does thermal energy travel from your finger to the cold object? Okay. Heat travels from hot to cold. All right. That just reminds me of, uh, what was that? Uh, it was a Christmas movie there uh, a long time ago where um, the kid put his tongue onto a frozen goalpost because he got uh, dared to do it. Oh, forget the name of that movie. Good movie though. Um, number three, distinguish between temperature and heat. Okay. Temperature of a substance is related to the average kinetic energy of that substance. Heat is the thermal energy of a substance as it moves from hot to cold. Interesting. Distinguish between heat and thermal energy. Okay. Heat is the thermal energy of a substance as it moves from hot to cold, while thermal energy is the sum total of all energy found in the substance. Remember, thermal energy is potential and kinetic together. Okay. Five, what determines the direction of heat flow? The amount of thermal energy in the substance flows from a high to a lower thermal energy. What else we got? Entropy and enthalpy. Entropy, enthalpy. Entropy is a measure of disorder or randomness of a system. And generally how science works is, um, the, you see, the reason why we eat food, we eat that banana to stop entropy, to stop chaos. We take this banana, take its vitamins, its nutrients, its energy, and reorder our own cells and build, all right? We're fighting entropy. Uh, you can't fight entropy forever. You put a banana into the backyard, within a week, it's gone. Everything goes to chaos. Everything goes to disorder. That's generally how things go. Things break down. All right. We fight entropy by eating these kind. Of, and, uh, and enthalpy is defined as the sum of the internal energy of a system and the product of the pressure and volume of this system. Now, what does all this mean here? Thermodynamics is a study of heat as it transforms into different forms of energy. We've already talked about one of them, thermal energy. Okay, but energy can exist in different forms. All right, as Homer says, the change in thermal energy of a substance equals the heat added to it minus the work done on it. So this is a very simple equation. The the delta U, which is the change in thermal energy, okay, is equal to the, the heat added to it, which is Q, and then we minus any work done on it, all right? So energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transforms into other forms. So when you have a look here, 
the enthalpy of an isolated system not in equilibrium will tend to increase over time, approaching a maximum value, okay? Or, better properly said, heat never spontaneously flows from a cold substance to a warmer substance, okay? So this is why heat always travels from a hotter to a colder. Because, as I said there before, there really is no definition for cold other than absence of heat. All right. The second law of thermodynamics, whenever heat flow is spontaneous, that is without the assistance of external work, the direction of flow is always from hot to cold. Okay. So in winter, heat flow flows from inside your house to the colder air outside your house. In summer, the flow of heat comes from outside your house to inside your house, okay? That's uh, what we say spontaneous, unassisted, okay? But we can, like scientists can get cold temperatures minus 250 degrees in the laboratory, but it costs money. It costs energy to do that because we're not going with the flow. We're trying to create uh, a weird instance there in the lab. So I can reverse this process, but it costs energy to do this. Heat can only be made to flow in the other way if work is done to the system. There we go. That means it's going to cost money to do things another way. But you see, this is free money up here. Okay. Uh, air conditioning, heat pumps, refrigerators, these kinds of things, we can create alternate uh, environments, but they're not free. The entropy of a perfect crystal at absolute zero is exactly equal to zero. But no system can ever really reach zero because absolute zero, and I use this example a lot, that you can only find absolute zero out in space in between Jupiter and Saturn, out in the deep, dark reaches of space where there are no atoms. It's just nothing. And if I got into my spaceship and flew out there, got my spacesuit on with my thermometer, and I'm out, I'm in space, and I go to the spot there and I got my temperature. What? It's not reading absolute zero. It's reading minus 263 degree. Well, what? I'm in the middle of nowhere, man. There's not, oh, I see now. I brought myself. I brought my thermometer here. So I have mass. My thermometer has mass. And if something has mass, that means it's occupying space, which means that it has energy, which means that this area now is not absolute zero. So it's this absolute zero concept, minus 273 degrees Celsius, it's kind of a theoretical thing because we can't really measure it because if we bring the measuring tools to outer space, we've now brought mass and energy. So therefore, you know, we really can't reach it. Um, another great video. This one here is actually really, 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 you'll look, the make it through the first 15, 20 seconds. It's an older, it's from uh, the 50s, but it really explains thermodynamics. What we just talked about right here, first, second, third law of thermodynamics, it's all right here in this video and kind of a fun video. Um, these guys are brilliant and it's really old. I think it's like 70 or 80 years old, but have a look at this video. It's cool. It'll explain thermodynamics in a nutshell in kind of an alternative, kind of a fun way. Okay. And the two things I want you to get from that are heat is work and work is heat. Heat cannot travel from a cooler substance to a hotter one. Have a look at those. Okay. Uh, and we're at the end here, which is exactly where I want it to be after about an hour and 10 minutes. And uh, 
How does the law of conservation of energy relate to the first law of thermodynamics? When thermal energy transfers as heat, the energy lost in one place has to be gained somewhere else. Energy can't just dissipate. It's got to go somewhere. And how does the second law of thermodynamics relate to the direction of heat flow? When heat flows spontaneously, it flows from hot to cold. Okay. Um, this is a little uh, thing here that just kind of shows you here. Temperature, thermal energy, heat, and law of thermodynamics. Temperature is a measure of thermal energy. Thermal energy is a, com a combination of kinetic and potential. Heat is thermal energy in transit. And the laws of thermodynamics uh, show how heat is transformed one way to another. Okay, you've got chemical energy, thermal energy, electrical energy. You've got all these different kinds of energy. Okay, and that is it. That's all we got. Uh, next week, I'll open up lab number four and quiz two will open. Okay, so this quiz will be on week seven. Okay, which was open two weeks ago, but we did the lecture there last week, or sorry, yesterday. So quiz two will be on week seven, week eight, what we just read down with heat, and it will also be on next week's. So I'll open that up a little earlier to give you guys a little chance there to have a look at it. Next Tuesday, I will have a lecture on it. The quiz will be open for a week, okay? So make sure that you have a look at week seven, week eight, and week nine. And then you guys can do the quiz. You'll have a week to do it. And then the test will open up the week after. And I don't, I haven't even, I've got a test. I've got a, I haven't even looked at it yet, but we'll get there and all that. But I hope you guys are good. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing uh, right now and turn off the video. So that's what I got. That's all I got. I hope you guys are good. And, uh...